In this lecture, we will be discussing another solved problem on shortest job first scheduling. And this question was also asked in GATE 2016 CSE. Alright, so let's see what is this question and how we can solve it. So here is the question. Consider the following processes with the arrival time and the length of the CPU burst given in milliseconds. The scheduling algorithm used is preemptive shortest remaining time first. The average turnaround time of these processes is dash milliseconds. So what we are given in this question is that we are given a set of four processes with process IDs P1 to P4 with their arrival times given here in milliseconds and their burst times given here in milliseconds. And we are told that the scheduling algorithm used is preemptive shortest remaining time first. So this is another name for the shortest job for scheduling. And what we have to keep in mind that it is preemptive. That means when one process is executing, if another process of shorter burst time arrives, then the executing process can be preempted or the CPU can be taken away from it and given to the shorter process. So that is what it means. So the main question that we have is we have to calculate the average turnaround time for this set of processes. So we have already discussed what is turnaround time. So we have to calculate the turnaround time for these four processes and we have to see what is the average turnaround time and we have four options a 8.25 b 10.25 c 6.35 and d 4.25 all right so let us see how we can solve this problem all right so i have just copied that table down here to make it fit on the screen so let us see how we can solve it so the first step in solving this kind of questions is to form the gan chart for the set of processes that we have so let us see how we can form the GAN chart for this set of four processes P1 to P4 if they arrive at these arrival times and if they have these burst times and if they are following a preemptive shortest remaining time first scheduling. Alright, so here is a GAN chart. Now let us see how we have formed this GAN chart. So first of all, let us see in this arrival time which is the first process that arrives. So we see that P1 is the process that arrives first. It arrived at the time 0. So at 0 milliseconds P1 arrived. So since it is the first process to arrive and since there were no processes at that time shorter than P1, so the CPU is assigned to P1 directly. So P1 begins its execution. And which is the next process to arrive after P1? So the next process to arrive after P1 is process P2. And we see that P2 has arrived at time 3. So at the third millisecond P2 arrives. Now let us see what is the burst time of process P2 and let's see if P1 will be preempted. So we see that the burst time of process P2 is 6 milliseconds. And what is the burst time of P1? The burst time of P1 is 10 milliseconds, but we see that P2 arrived at the third millisecond. So at the third millisecond, P1 was already executing and it has completed 3 milliseconds of its execution. So from the total burst time of 10 milliseconds, P1 has already executed. 3 milliseconds. So what is the remaining time for P1? What is the remaining burst time for P1? It is 7 milliseconds. So the remaining burst time of P1 is 7 milliseconds and the burst time of P2 which has arrived at the third millisecond is 6 milliseconds. So which is smaller among these? We see that P2 is obviously smaller. 6 is smaller than 7. So P1 will be preempted and P2 will be given the CPU for its execution. So here we see that at the third millisecond, P1 is preempted and P2 is given the CPU. And how long will P2 execute? The burst time of P2 is 6 milliseconds. So let us see if it will be allowed to continue its execution or what will happen. So if we see the next arrival time, the next process to arrive after P2 is process P3 that arrives at the seventh millisecond. So let's see at the 7th millisecond what is the condition of P2. So the burst time of P2 is 6 milliseconds and it began its execution from the 3rd millisecond. So from the 3rd millisecond we have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So from 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6 and 6 to 7. So 4 milliseconds of execution is completed for process P2. So what is the remaining burst time for process P2 at 7 milliseconds? It is 2 milliseconds. So the remaining burst time for P2 at the 7th millisecond is 2 millisecond. And at that time P3 had arrived. And what is the burst time of P3? 
it is 1 millisecond. So among P2 and P3, which is the smaller one, we see that P3 is obviously the smaller one. It has only 1 millisecond of burst time. So P2 will also be preempted and P3 will be given the CPU. So we see in the Gantt chart that at the 7th millisecond when P3 arrives, P2 is preempted and P3 gets the CPU. And P3 executes for 1 millisecond. And after executing for 1 millisecond, we see that in this arrival time, at the 8th millisecond, the next process arrives which is P4. And what is the burst time of P4? It is 3 milliseconds. So we see that P3 already completed its execution because it had only 1 millisecond of burst time. Now the processes that we have are P4 with 3 milliseconds and P2 which has a remaining burst time of 2 milliseconds and P1 which also has a remaining burst time of 7 milliseconds. So which is the smallest among these three? So we see 7, 2 and 3 here and the smallest one is obviously 2. So P2 will be the next one to get the CPU. So we see that after this P3 releases the CPU at the 8th millisecond, P2 gets the CPU. And how long will P2 execute? It will execute for 2 milliseconds because that is its remaining burst time. So P2 executes from 8 to 10 milliseconds. And after that, P2 will release the CPU. And who is the next one that will get? So the remaining processes that we have are P1 with a burst time of 7 milliseconds and P4 with a burst time of 3 milliseconds. So which is smaller among these two? It is obviously P4. It has a burst time of 3 milliseconds which is smaller than 7 which is of P1. So P4 will be the next one to get the CPU. So at the 10th millisecond P2 releases the CPU and P4 gets the CPU. And how long will P4 execute? It will execute for 3 milliseconds. So from 10 up to 13. 10 plus 3 is 13. So up to the 13 millisecond, P4 uses the CPU and then it will release a CPU. And what is the only process that is left now? That is P1. So finally, P1 will again get the CPU at the 13th millisecond when P4 releases it and P1 will execute for 7 milliseconds. So 13 plus 7 gives us 20. So at the 20th millisecond, P1 completes its execution. And here we have the full GAN chart for this set of four processes P1 to P4. So whenever we have this kind of problems, it is crucial to form the GAN chart, whether you are calculating the average waiting time or the average turnaround time or whatever it may be. So once we have formed the GAN chart, it is very easy to proceed with the remaining portion of our calculation. All right. So now we have the GAN chart and what we have to calculate, our original question was to calculate the average turnaround time for this set of processes. So for that, we have to first calculate the turnaround time for these processes one by one. So what is the formula for turnaround time? So the formula for turnaround time is completion time minus the arrival time. So we know that turnaround time is actually the time that the process takes for its entire execution, including the time it was waiting. So the turnaround time will be the completion time, the time when the process actually completed its full execution. And from that, we have to subtract the arrival time. That means the time when the process arrived. So from the completion time, if we subtract the arrival time, we will get the turnaround time, which is the entire time the process spent in executing, including the waiting times. All right. So using this formula, let us calculate the turnaround times for these processes P1 to P4. So first of all, the turnaround time for process P1. So what is the completion time of P1? So if you look at the GAN chart, we see that the completion time of process P1 is 20 milliseconds. This is where P1 fully completed its execution. We saw that P1 executed for some period of time here, but that was not its complete execution. P1 actually completed its full execution at the 20th millisecond. So you look at the Gantt chart and you find the last occurrence of that particular process and see when it completed. That will be the completion time. So for P1, it is 20 milliseconds minus the arrival time of P1. For that, you have to look at the table. So arrival time of P1 is zero. So 0 milliseconds. So the turnaround time is 20 minus 0 which is 20 milliseconds. So next the turnaround time for process P2. So what is the completion time of P2? Search for the last occurrence of P2 in the Gantt chart. It is over here. And what is the completion time? It is 10 milliseconds. So from that you have to subtract the arrival time. So from the table we can see that the arrival time of P2 is 3 milliseconds. So 10 minus 3 gives us 7 milliseconds. Now for P3 the turnaround time will be the completion time of P3 is 
8 milliseconds. So this is the first and last occurrence of P3 in this GAN chart. So 8 is the completion time for P3 and the arrival time of P3 was 7 milliseconds. So 8 minus 7 gives us 1 millisecond. And the turnaround time for P4 similarly will be completion time of P4 which is 13 milliseconds. So this is the first and last occurrence of P4 as well. So 13 is the completion time of P4 minus the arrival time which is 8 milliseconds. So 13 minus 8 gives us 5 milliseconds. So we have found the turnaround times for processes P1 to P4. Now we just have to calculate the average turnaround times for this. So the average turnaround time will be 20 plus 7 plus 1 plus 5 divided by the number of processes which is 4 and that gives us 33 divided by 4 which gives us 8.2 milliseconds. So this is the average turnaround time for this set of processes P1 to P4 when they arrive at these arrival times with these burst times and when they follow a preemptive shortest remaining time for scheduling. So let us see if we have 8.25 in our options. So coming back to the problem, if you see these options A, B, C, D, we see that option A is 8.25 and 8.25 was what we got from our solution. So option A is the answer for this question. So I hope this lecture about calculating the average turnaround time for a preemptive shortest remaining time first algorithm was clear to you. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.